The whole reason I built a recording rig in my house was so that I could make my own music. And because the main way I make music is I'll play everything myself. I pile it all on top of each other, play the drums, play the bass, play the guitar, play the ARP 2600 synthesizer, uh, you know, like sample the cat, whatever. And uh, so that's the whole reason I built the thing. And I, this is the first time I've had, I've usually just had like eight tracks, four tracks, cassette machines, whatever. And I finally got the opportunity to go 24 track, and then, of course, all my friends want me to record them now. <laughs> it's like, hey. On well, was pretty simple. Um, I worked in A&B Sounds Warehouse for a little while. And uh, one of the things that they do, or at least they did, I don't know if they do it anymore, was everything is per label, say all the stuff on Sony was uh, in alphanumeric order by serial number. So, you know, FC 90112 would be before, you know, KC 90112. And um, a lot of bands would come in. The first, the one I remember was when No Means No did their Mama album and they came into that warehouse and they wanted to put some on consignment at AMB. And it had no serial number and it had no label name. It wasn't on any, you know, it wasn't on No Means No records or anything. It was just No Means No Mama. <clears throat> and they said, well, what label's it on? Well, it's not really on any label. Okay, well, what's the serial number? Well, it doesn't really have one. So it was up to me to concoct a serial number for the thing and sort of a label name for it. I think we called it Mama 001. And um, it got me thinking when we made the first Shovelhead tape that we should, you know, invent a name for a record label and uh, give it a serial number just in case anybody did want to carry it, they'd have some way of filing it. So we, Incentive was a name I'd had in my head for eons. And um, we just put INC001. And then it dawned on me, well, gee, if I'm going to put out something other than cassettes, I'm going to need a different prefix. Having worked in the industry a little bit, I figured this out. So I figured INC would stand for cassette, IND would stand for disc, and INR would stand for record. So. And then I just, it just was just sort of done as a joke, and then I forget who it was. <clears throat> I think it was shut down or section 46 or something. He said, can we put our tape out on incentive? And I went, sure. And I mean, that's the way it's always been. It's just, you know, it's a label people stick on their tape. And it gives the illusion of this, you know, you're in, you're in the office of incentive records right now, by the way. This is, this is where it's at. And uh, it's uh, basically, it's uh, something that gives all the bands that are on it some sort of sense of unity um, as opposed to every band putting out a record on you know Joe Blow Records or whatever um, people will hear something on incentive that they really really like and they might see another one they say well you know gee I remember that other thing on incentive was pretty good maybe I'll you know I'll listen to this and even you know, radio people I'm sure work that way I work that way I'm a pretty serious record freak and um, if I hear a record on, you know, well, back in the old days of punk, for instance, SST, run by Black Flag, put out a whole bunch of good records, you know. And ever, ever after that, if I saw a record I didn't know anything about, but it was on SST, I'd be like, well, maybe I'll, gee, I wonder what this is all about. So that's the whole incentive story in a nutshell. Nobody, the bands have all paid for and sold their own tapes and CDs and stuff. I've never put the money up for any of them. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's a record label, basically, in that if somebody writes me wanting to get in touch with uh, anybody who put a, a disc or a tape or something on incentive, I can work as the sort of liaison point, I suppose, but that's about it. <laughs> so if I, if I win the lottery, that may change. I'll start paying for the pressings and paying for advertising and stuff, but, um, you know, it's just sort of that little mm, unity thing. As far as recordings that I've, I'm on, that are out in the marketplace or have been. You got the shovel, there's the Shovelhead CD, which is essentially two albums. There's the Swamp Rod CD, which was the other band that I kind of run, I guess you could say. And there's um, a couple of Show Business Giants CDs that I'm on. I'm on the Sandra Lockwood record, Fair Amount. I did all the goofy stuff that we couldn't find. Like we didn't know anybody who played steel guitar, so I kind of learned how to play it for this. And there's the Hissonall record, of course. 
which is the thing I do with my friend Andy Kerr, who used, used to be in No Means No. And he lives in Amsterdam, I live here, so we mail stuff back and forth, and he'll send me a half started song and I'll finish it off and he'll do vice versa and then we'll connect every year or so and we get the same room together and mix it all down and maybe tidy it up and we'll make a record out of it. And, well, we did one last year that wasn't even really, we didn't even want to make a record out of it necessarily, we just did it for fun. And uh, it came out sounding pretty good so uh, Alternative Tentacles Records picked it up, they really liked it. So they put it out and uh, a lot of people seem to like it, so we're going to do another one. Maybe we'll even uh, get ourselves a drummer or something and uh, do some live shows. Well, hiss and all means hiss, including the hiss. It's Andy and Scott hiss and all, you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, we had a contest on the CBC, I taped it. They asked on the CBC, what is hiss and all? We got some pretty good answers. Somebody said it was protective undergarments for seniors. And a couple of them were these long, rambling, poetic things that didn't make any sense. And, we gave the best 10 of them LPs. <laughs> There's a really good scene here, and uh, it's not really well known. It's really well known a lot amongst a lot of people that um, are fairly, uh, have a lot of exposure. And uh, as a result, you know, there's, I mean, it's as out of the way as it gets for a music hotbed in North America. Uh, you know, people think Seattle's out of the way. <laughs> There's a lot of very creative music in Victoria. The fact that it's on an island, it's far away from major media centers, means that the music here is, for the most part, strikingly original. Depending on the kind of music you like, you've probably heard of a few of the bands, no matter where you live in the world. There's a, um, a certain amount of backbiting and uh, stuff because the venues in town are so few. Well, the venues in town are kind of a little bit more limited. There used to be, you know, any, any at any given time, there was two or three clubs, there was lots of halls you could rent. Uh, there was people's basements you could play in. There's always been at least one basement place in Victoria. There was, you know, in the infamous Bonehead's basement where, uh, I mean, hey, Green Day played in Bonehead's basement. We're going to Mile Zero, meet you there. Yeah! Drink beer! Drink beer! And of course, it's just it's absolutely illegal. You know, you can have you can have twenty thousand people screaming their heads off at Royal Athletic Park and keeping everybody up all night. But uh, you have thirty kids in a soundproof basement across the street. It's a heinous violation of the law, and they're going to send fourteen cops there to pepper spray everybody, which happened on a really disturbingly regular basis at that place. This is EBA. You want to see the birds? See the birds? See the birds? See the birds?